Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure to be at IPAM. So yeah, I'll be bringing the Boston cold to this conference. Arctic and ice, these are not topics that are probably um, Los in the Los Angeles geography. But I hope they'll be familiar to asymptotic combinatorics. Um, uh, okay. So I probably don't need to introduce what an alternating sign matrix is, but uh, just to fix notation, I will. So, um, so it's an n by n matrix. Each entry is minus 1, 0, or 1, and it satisfies the following two properties. In each, um, uh, you have in each row and column, the non-zero entries alternate between minus 1 and 1. And in each row and column, they sum to 1. So this forces you to, in, say, going from top to bottom, in each column, you have zero, uh, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, et cetera. So here's an example of a uh, 7 by 7 alternating sign matrix. And the, the basic question we'll be uh, interested in understanding is, if I pick one of these alternating sign matrices uniformly at random, how does, how does it look? OK, now look, you need to make sense of the word look. So um, uh, I'll be talking about the, the, the frozen region of the so-called Arctic boundary for these alternating sign matrices. So uh, you already see from the example that um, OK, well, it's a general phenomenon that you have sort of at most one, for example, in the, in the bottom row, you have at most one, you have exactly one, one. So that means there's going to be a bunch of zeros. And on the row above it, you have at most uh, two, one. I mean, so, I mean, yeah, you have, a, uh, you have at most two ones, et cetera. So this already suggests that at least in sort of the bottom right corner, what's the pointer? Yeah. In the sort of bottom right corner and the bottom left corner and the you know th these corners, you should see a bunch of zeros. So we'll define um, a frozen region of M, and it's probably just easiest to see by the picture. But what I'll say is that a zero, a, a, an integer, like a, um, an entry i j, is in the frozen region of this Arctic boundary if either one of its quadrants are fully packed with zeros. So for example, here the zero, it's Northeast quadrant is all full of zeros. At this point, it's southeast quadrant is all full of zeros. Here it's again southwest, and here the if I look at this zero, the north um, the northwest quadrant is packed with zeros. However, if you look at this zero, for example, it's none none of its quadrants are full of zeros. For example, I see a one here, a one here, a one here, and a one here. So this is what I just defined to be the frozen region of an ASM. And the question I can now formulate it more precisely is what is the boundary of the frozen region of this ASM? So when does, what is the interface between this sort of bluish part of the matrix and the, the black part of the matrix? Um, okay. So I will define, I'll, I'll parameter, I'll write down the explicit formula for, so okay, the theorem will be a classification of that boundary and so I have to write down what this curve is gonna be. And um, so I'll first, so it's going to be not, it's not going to be, as this last bullet point suggests, it's not going to be smooth. I'm going to define, it's going to be some inscribed curve inside the unit square in the limit. Uh, but it's not going to be smooth in the sense that it, each, each of these four vertices where it's tangent to the square, it's going to be, it's, it's going to have a, um, it's third continuous, it's third, third derivative is not going to exist there. Second derivative is going to discon be um, discontinuous there. So I'm going to define it sort of, one, one portion at a time. The first portion, I'll define the first portion, and the other, the other, the other three are going to be reflections. So the first portion is just an ellipse. So I, I've written it in that first centered line there. So this is an ellipse. It's, I've written it, so look, it's 2x minus 1 squared plus 2y minus 1 squared minus 4 times 1 minus x times y is 1. And if you, if you sort of, maybe more pictorially, it looks something like, something like this. So this is, this is how, and I'm intersecting it with the southeast sort of portion of the score. So this is the first part of this Arctic curve. This is this A, what I call A southeast. Now the other parts of the curve are going to be reflections, the obvious reflections of, of this in the different directions. Okay, so now you have four portions and taking the union of them gives you this, this curve, which I call this fancy A. This, um, and uh, again, I'll reiterate that I won't, I mean, it is, a, it is a direct consequence of the formula. You can see that A is not smooth at the four tangency points, but it's algebraic elsewhere. Okay, so now I can, I can say the theorem basically. So, okay, so we'll let a, a, N be a very large integer. We'll let M denote an N by N alternating sign matrix chosen uniformly at random. 
I'll let ij, so I'll, ij is the point that I'm sort of trying to probe here. So it's an integer pair. I view it as sort of an entry in the matrix. And then I'll let z be the normalization of it. I divide by you know, i over n times uh, j over n. I just take the, the normalization of, of z so that it, it, it sits in the unit score. And I'll fix some, some epsilon um, bigger than zero. On the, I mean, the reason is I have this, I have this arctic, I have this arctic curve here, which I defined in the previous slide. And I won't be able to say anything in like a very small. I mean, so epsilon is anything. It's arbitrary. It can be 0.0001 or like it can be one 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 millionth or whatever. But I can't say exactly what happens on the arctic curve. So I have this sort of shadow region where I can't say anything. But outside of this, I mean, if I'm either inside A or outside of A, and I'm, I'm, in, and I'm at a tiny distance epsilon from A, then I can say exactly what's going on. So, okay, so the theorem is that with this very high probability, one minus exponentially decaying, and all if I if I um, omit a, if I omit an event whose probability decays exponentially uh, with n, then this point i j is in the frozen region if I'm, if and only if I'm outside of this A. So, this part here is. This is frozen, and this is not frozen. Okay, so there's at least there's going to be if I if I if I sort of expand a by a little bit, there's at least going to be one non-zero entry in this very tiny epsilon expanded version. Uh, just, do you know the parameters of this ellipsoid? Do I know the the parameters of the ellipsoid? I I just gave it from the previous slide. That's 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 the that's the um that that top equation there is the parameterization of this part of the ellipse. And then I reflect to get the others. Yeah. OK. So this was predicted um, um, in various formulations dating from uh, you know, the, the early 2000s, slightly before, so Elorant, and then uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the names. But OK, so you can see that various people have predicted the existence of this Arctic boundary. Although the, the exact way, the exact parameterization, the one that I had on my previous slide, the sort of union of ellipses didn't come until 2010 by Coloma and Pronko. And I was told by um, Sportiello uh, that he has a different proof of this result. He told me this last May. It's going to be different both in terms of, I, from what, what he told I mean, I don't know anything about the status of this proof, so don't, don't ask me. But um, uh, from what I understand, it's, it's different both in terms of mathematically and sort of heuristically from, from what I'm about to present. So it's somewhat in a different direction. Anyway, so my goal is to sort of give you some sort of understanding about how to prove this, prove this theorem. Um, and it's going to proceed along the lines of this tangent method um, that um, uh, uh, was mentioned in the previous talk. So, so, so the delta does depend on z, right? It does not depend on z. It depends on epsilon. Yeah. I mean, it has to depend on that, because I can't say exactly what's going on in the Arctic curve. Yeah, but it doesn't depend. Yeah, right. Um, Okay. So yeah, as long as I'm within an so as long as an outside of an epsilon, you know, cloud of the boundary, I can I can tell you whether or not you're frozen or liquid. Okay. Okay. Right. So I am going to try to get away from the six vertex model I'm from from the from this alternating side matrix. I'm going to re-express everything in terms of the six vertex model, where everything is uh, more easily interpretable in terms of paths. I mean, again, um, this was described in the last talk. So uh, okay, I'll start out with some some domain uh, lambda. So just to define the six vertex model, we've seen, we've seen it very many times uh, throughout this conference. So we'll assign each vertex in, in, in this lambda, one of the six following arrow configurations. Of course, the rule is this ice rule. Arrows, the number of arrows coming in has to equal the number of arrows coming out. Uh, and neighboring arrow configurations have to be consistent in the sense that you know if an, if an arrow exits this vertex, then it has to vertically, then it has to enter this vertex vertically. The ice model is so of course the, the standard the standard situation is that you give a weight to each vertex. In the ice model, the ice point of this model, we give each vertex weight one. And um, so this corresponds to the uniform measure on all of these six vertex ensembles. And domain wall boundary conditions are when all arrows come in from the left and exit from the top. Okay. So we can view six vertex ensembles as collections of non-crossing paths. So, uh, you know, the, the the bottommost one goes like this, and then etc. Also, these osculating paths that were again mentioned in the previous talk. Okay, so again, sorry, this is a again sort of review. Uh, but, uh, the there is a standard bijection between alternating side matrices and domain wall six vertex ensembles. So, each at each one or minus one, you put a uh, a corner, you know, uh, a corner I showed in this chart, 
And this is a bijection. This 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 turns out to be a bijection between alternating side matrices and domain wall six vertex ensembles. So here, this one, for example, turns into a into uh, this corner here. And the moment you fix all the corners of the ensemble, the rest of the the rest of the configuration is, is forced. So that determines it. Okay. So the south. Okay. So now. Okay. So now um, I want to again convert this whole story into a question about the six vertex model instead of the, the alternating side matrix. So. The first observation I'll make, which is straightforward more or less, is that the trajectory of the bottommost path corresponds to the boundary between this um, this frozen region and the, uh, the, the the sort of the southeast part of the frozen region. So by um, so the value of this is by various symmetries of the model. In order to calculate this this frozen region, these the, the four pieces. Remember, all I need to do is understand the trajectory of this bottom most path and then apply the obvious symmetries to obtain the full curve. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to say. So now I can just formulate everything in terms of the six vertex model, ignore the alternating side matrix. So same notation as before, I start with an integer n, I let epsilon, uh, sorry, I let this e, this fancy e denote a uh, sample of the ice model with dom this domain wall boundary ice model on this square. I denote the non-crossing paths in e from top to bottom, oh, so bottom to top by p1, p2, etc. So the uh, this, this green curve is P1, and then the, the one above it is P2, et cetera. So I keep on going up that way. And um, okay, this I, okay, so this maybe is unnecessarily confusing. This I1 is simply this, is simply this interval. I2 is this interval. And then the, this B is this, this, um, this, this B here is the southeast part of the Arctic curve. So it's what you expect. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's so this, this, this union here, I1, this B here, or this, sorry, this P, this I1 union A union I2 is, is this thing here. And the theorem is that um, uh, with very high probability, if I normalize P1, the, the bottommost path by N, then the distance between this normalized object and, 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 and this fancy P here is less than epsilon with exponential probability. Um, so uh, this distance is Euclidean distance. So yeah. Um, okay. So any questions about the theorem statements? No. So the proof is going to be based on a mathematical justification of this geometric tangent method that was described in the previous talk. It was a general heuristic introduced by Coloma and Sportiello in 2016 for deriving Arctic boundaries of certain types of statistical mechanical models. And uh, I'll do it in the ice case because it's simplest. But I think that the method should, I mean, it doesn't really use that much about the ice model. I did it for convenience um, there. But I think it should apply to other families of models. And in the, in the paper, I actually deal with a slightly different, I again deal with an ice model, but on a different domain. It's the so-called three bundle domain. So it looks like, so it's a, uh, so it looks like this. I mean, there are three bundles of lines, and they all intersect. And you can define an ice model on this domain, and then you can analyze the Arctic curves. And the method works equally well there. And I assume I, I, my, my guess or hope is that it would work very well for other families of models. OK, so I will start. OK, so the plan of the talk is the following. So I first want to explain this heuristic, because without the heuristic, it's going to be very difficult to sort of follow the proof. And it's a very nice heuristic also as well. Um, and then, so I'll, I'll found, spend a few slides trying to describe this heuristic, and then I'll try to go into more um, technical discussions on, on, on the proofs. Okay. So uh, in order to describe this heuristic, uh, I think it was more or less also described in, in um, the previous talk. This talk. Um, uh, so, uh, but I'll, I'll derive it again, and may, maybe a little bit slightly more detailed explanation of this heuristic. So we'll start with a domain wall six vertex ensemble P, uh, sorry, E, and then its paths are P1, P2, starting from the bottom to the top. And we'll let this theta denote the location where P1 exits the bottom row. So again, in this case, theta is three. It, it goes horizontally for three steps, and then it exits by one. So I'm just letting theta be the number of horizontal steps taken by the bottommost path in this ensemble. Okay, and I'll define Zn to be the number of domain wall six vertex ensembles. So this is c counted by the alternating sign matrix, for example, conjecture, for example, or theorem now, for example by a quotient product of quotient of factorials. And uh, this refined uh, partition function, ZNK, denotes the number of such ensembles, the number of these domain with six, wall, uh, vertex, six vertex domain wall en ensembles with a specified value of this data. So it, it, the, um, I'm refining this partition function based on the number of, based on the location where the bottommost path exits um, 
the, uh, the, 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 the lowest row. And I'll define this correlation function, this uh, h and of k to be the probability that if I pick one of these guys at random, this, these ensembles at random, the probability that theta is equal to k. So it's simply given by this ratio of zn of k divided by zn. Okay, and the point, the, the main fact that underlies this, um, I mean, so the, sort of the, the tangent method um, is not such, it, it doesn't rely so heavily on the integrability of the model. What it, what it really relies on is understanding what this hn of k behaves like asymptotically. Of course, if the model has some sort of integrability properties, that's an immediate indication that you might hope for hn of k to be exact and therefore you'd be able to analyze its asymptotics. So in particular in the ice case, this is the result that's almost 25 years old by Don Zadberger. He um, as our, um, the proof of the refined alternating symmetric conjecture is that he proved um, that this, he provided an exact formula for this hn of k, again by um, product and quotient of binomial coefficients. It just has a direct consequence of this formula. If I scale k linearly and I ask myself what the probability is that say um, this, that this bottom of, so here's this length of n, that this bottommost path exits at some location kappa n, it scales exponentially in n with some explicit rate function, which I've called h of kappa, it's completely irrelevant what this thing is. I mean, for computations, it's irrelevant, but I don't, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna play with this function at all during the talk. Um, but the point is that it's exact, and I know, so what this is telling me is that I know more or less the large deviations probability for the event that the bottommost path exits the bottommost row at a given site, k, k, kappa n. Okay. Um, so, the place where this h, this math, this, this frac h is minimized is gonna tell me the most likely, because there's a minus sign there, it's gonna tell me the most likely location where this bottommost path exits the bottommost row, okay? And a quick computation using this function is that you'll see that the minimum of this, this h appears at cap equals zero, where this h actually vanishes, in which case this h, uh, in which case, so that will be more or less the maximum of your refined partition function. And what that's more or less telling you is that the bottommost path basically exits the bottommost row about halfway, about halfway along, um, halfway along the bottommost row. So this is morally giving you the the tangency point, the tangency point of the Arctic curves, so to speak. Uh, um, and I mean, this is heuristic at the moment. And um, I mean, sort of the remarkable feature of this, this tangent method heuristic of Colombo and Sportiello is that they use the full, I mean, so I, I've only used the minimum of h to obtain the tangency point. But the, 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 the remarkable fact is that you can actually use the full formula for h to determine the whole Arctic curve. Okay, so uh, any questions so far? Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, please. So, the, so why is the data again? Sorry? The data? The data? It's it's the location of it's the refi it's the place where the bottommost path exits the bottommost row. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So okay, as, yeah, as I said previously, um, the uh, this sort of refined uh, this, this this tangent method proceeds by introducing an augmented domain. So what you do is you take as as Flip was saying, you sort of take one of these paths and pull it down a snitch. Um, and you um, pull it down, so you fix some integer psi, and you pull, say, um, you, you take a domain wall six vertex ensemble, but with an additional path that enters through this location, uh, zero minus psi, so it enters around here, and it exits as it would in a domain wall ensemble, okay? And the point is to use this new path to sort of probe information about the model. And I'll call again, so, purely notational, I'll denote the, the paths in this new augmented ensemble by P1 aug, P2 aug, although it's a PN, but they're gonna be now N plus one paths uh, because I've taken N paths and I've added one more. Okay. And we'll let, okay, by, I'm, ab I'm abusing notation a little bit here. Um, I'm gonna let theta denote, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna let theta denote the location where this P1 aug exits. Uh, exits the x-axis. So for the rest of the talk, that's my theta. Okay, I'm not gonna change it anymore. So in this case, theta is five, it's because it exits the x-axis at this coordinate five comma zero. Okay. Please, yeah. So now you're adding a new path at the, at the bottom? Correct. At the bottom. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm taking, I'm taking n pads as I did in the original ensemble, and then I'm pulling one, I'm adding one more that starts at this location zero minus psi. And then its behavior is going to be able to tell me something about the behavior of the original model. Okay. When you add it, you, uh, what, what's the condition? Uh, what, what, uh, is, is it conditioned with respect to the, to the other path or something? No, no, this is just, I just, this is just a definition of what I mean by ensemble. I'm going to eventually take a random one, but I'm not conditioning on anything yet. This is just, yeah, I'm just, I'm just defining this augmented ensemble to be a six, a domain wall six vertex ensemble with one new path added at this location. So this is just purely definitional at the moment. Okay, and then I'm defining theta to be the location where this path exits the, the x-axis. So, yeah. Okay. So, okay, so now this is sort of the, um, one of the features that makes this tangent method work. So, um, um, so okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, like I was scaling this k, like some kappa n, I'm going to scale this psi like some little psi n, and then I'm going to create, I'm going to, pull out, I'm going to pick uh, one of these augmented path ensembles, these augmented six vertex ensembles uniformly at random. So I fix psi, I make it scale like this psi n, and then I'm going to pick one uniformly at random. Okay, so then this, um, this new path will exit at some location theta and uh, dependent, so theta is random, right, because, I've, because the ensemble is now random, and I'm going to call it, in the, um, what, I'll, what I'll show on the next slide is that this theta here um, is approximately equal to some theta theta n, so it scales like n uh, for some for some explicit value of theta uh, psi. So, okay, so I'll, I'll I'll discuss that a little bit more on the next slide. But now the belief is that the sort of the belief behind one of the beliefs behind the tangent method is that this new this augmented path this p this this p one aug is going to start out being a line because again it's a, it's detached from the other paths in the ensemble. It's going to start out as a line, then it's going to be tangent to the arctic curve and then it's going to merge with it. So this is just the belief behind the tangent method, and there are two reasons why it was originally, why, why, why it makes sense. The first is that if you plot it on a simulation, it works. The second is that it gives the right answer. So as I said, Coloma and Franco had a prediction uh, in 2010 for, for, this, for the Arctic curve of, the, of this alternating side matrix model. Using this, I'll explain on the next slide how to use this, if you believe in this prediction, how to use it heuristically to guess the Arctic curve. And remarkably, the two answers just coincide on the nose. So, I mean, so this is all very good evidence for why you might believe this to be true. And I guess one of the points of this talk is to, is to prove it. Um, okay, so now, okay, so as I said, I have this theta of n, which is this, this little theta, which is um, this scaling. So I, I have this capital theta, which is where the bottommost path exits the bottommost this x axis. And this theta is that divided by n, more or less. And now, so if I knew what that was, then I could determine this tangent line, okay? Right? Because I know that I, I just need two, two, two points in the line to determine, to determine the line. I know one of the points after the scaling, since the psi scales like psi n, one of the points is 0 minus psi. If I knew what this theta was, then the other point would be zero th theta 0. That would give me the line. And therefore, I would have a line tangent the arctic curve at zero minus psi. So this would, if I knew what this value of theta, I would be able to compute the tangent line through zero minus psi to the arctic curve. Then by varying over theta, I would get, you know, I'll get a tangent line starting from here, or a tangent line starting from here, et cetera. And the convex envelope of these lines would give me the full arctic curve. So then it remains, okay, so that would give me the full arctic curve, or the, the full green part of the arctic curve. And now what remains is to compute to figure out how to compute this 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 theta of psi, I need I need the second point on the line more or less. Okay. Now this is what's going to follow from the integrability of the model from the from the computation of the h. So let's just count. So let me just ask myself. Okay, how many augmented ensembles are there whose theta is equal to some given number of phi? Okay. So well, one of these augmented ensembles comes on two, comes with two parts. So if I, I can sort of divide it into the part below the x-axis and the part above the x-axis. So the part below the x-axis is simply a walk from zero minus psi to theta comma zero, right? So the number of these guys is given by a binomial coefficient, and this is exact. So if you want to do this on all the lattices, you, know, you might or might not, or with all the weights, you might or might not get a binomial coefficient, but you'll just get the partition function for a walk with those weights of the lattice. And then the second term here is, okay, so 
um, it, should, it should actually be z n plus 1 of, of phi, because this, the part above the x-axis, is simply a six-vertex ensemble. If I sort of extended this path this way, the, the tangent path, the tan tangent path, uh, to, to the, through the x-axis, this would now give me an n plus 1 dimensional, uh, sorry, uh, a six-vertex ensemble with n plus 1 paths and domain wall boundary data with the, with the given refinement of phi. So this, so the, the exact number of these domain, uh, these augmented ensembles with uh, theta equal to phi is given by z n plus 1 of phi times this binomial coefficient. But h and z are related, right? They're proportional to each other. I'm just dividing by the full partition function of the model. So I'm going to, so I, it's fair for me to say that uh, the number of augmented ensembles with a given value of theta is proportional to this, to this h times a binomial coefficient. Okay, and um, since I know, okay, I, this, this, this object I can easily compute the asymptotics of, right? I mean, this is just phi log, yeah, I mean, so I mean, you just use Stirling formula to, to compute. I mean, this isn't, yeah, right? You use Stirling formula to compute the asymptotics of this guy. And now we know the asymptotics of this guy, right? It's given by, by this, by this function h. So if I put them together, I know that this product behaves like, basically like um, the ex it decays exponential in n with some coefficient g phi, g psi of phi. And this g phi of psi is simply the h added to the entropy, this, the logarithm of this thing. Okay. And the maximizer of this, of this, um, of this g will tell me the most likely location where the bottom, this, 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 um, the most likely location of, 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 of theta, more or less, the most likely location or of this phi, the most likely location where this um, most likely refinement position for this augmented path. So that's how I compute this theta. So to recapitulate, uh, to summarize, the first thing we need in this tangent method is we need the exact asymptotics of this refined partition function. This gives us this fancy little low, lowercase h. Then I define this um, this g, this sort of deformation, given by the sum of the logarithm of the binomial coefficient with this h. I let this theta denote the maximizer of g, which is more or less telling me the macroscopic location of the place where the, the new line enters, uh, enters the x-axis. And then um, for each psi, I let L of psi denote the line connecting 0 minus psi to, to th 0 to, this should be beta 0, sorry. It's th th just this line here. Okay, and then I get, for each psi, I get a line, and then by taking the convex envelope of these lines, I'll get an arctic curve, okay? And that should be the answer. Okay, so now the issues with this, are, there, there are essentially three that I, I, think, I, I see. The first is that you need to justify the tangency assumption. Um, the second is that, okay, I'm, I'm saying, I mean, actually the tangency assumption itself is sort of problematic because I'm saying that the, this new path in the continuum should be tangent to the arctic curve, but I actually don't even know that the arctic curve exists, right? I mean, there's not a priori statement that tells me that. Um, or another way of saying that is I don't, I don't know that this P1 has a scaling limit, so I don't, what does it mean for it to be tangent? And the third issue is that even if I get all of this to work, I'm, it's only plausible for me to say that this tan path is tangent to some scaling limit of P2 og, right, of this, of this green path, the second path on the ensemble. But in principle, I have no way of relating, I mean, uh, you need to somehow say that the introduction of this new path doesn't change the arctic curve at all. For example, I want to be able to say that P1 og is tangent to P2 og, and P2 og is basically the, the P1, the, the bottommost curve in the original model. But um, yeah, so th th that's something that needs to be justified. Okay. So uh, okay. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to outline how to how to make this all work. So I mean, I guess before proceeding, I should ask if there are any questions. Okay. Nothing yet. So this yeah. Is all for uniform weights. Uniform weights. Yeah. Yeah. Does any of this? I haven't used anything about the only thing about uniform weights I've used is is this. So yeah. Yeah, if you have the H for that, you have it for anything. So this is, yeah, so this is just heuristic at the moment, and then proof is going to be a different story, but the proof is also not going to use anything about the weight. You'll, you'll, see, you'll see it, you'll see in a second. Okay, so now let me, let me go to the proofs. Okay, so let me try to explain how to make this argument uh, rigorous. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'll call this original model E, and I'll call the, I'll fix some psi, and I'll call the new model with this augmented model E, e, e psi. And they're both chosen uniformly at random. Okay. Now I'll let L of psi, this fancy L over there, denote uh, the tangent line from zero minus psi to the P2 og. Okay. So it, 
it might not be clear exactly what I mean by that. So I imagine sort of this dotted line starting out as horizontally, and then I rotate it, keep on rotating it until the first point where it meets the green curve, where, the, where it meets this P2 og. Okay, and I just call that line L psi. It might meet, it might meet uh, the green curve, this P2 og at multiple points. That's totally fine. Okay, I'll now let omega denote the x coordinate where this L meets the x axis. And again, I'll let theta denote the location where this P2 og um, exits, so the P1 of the tan, the tan, the tan path exits from the x axis. So, um, so uh, just to clarify what's random here, every, everything is basically random. So E is random, E psi is random. This, this psi here is picked once it is, is picked, but um, since, since the rest of the, since the configuration is, since each size is random, this L size is random because it's a, I mean, the configuration, um, this, this line, this tangent line is random, and therefore this omega is random and this, 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 this theta is random. So everything is more or less is random here. Okay? Okay. I'm going to couple them in a sec. I'm going to couple them soon enough. Okay. So now I'll, I'll try to outline how, how we're going to, how we're going to proceed. Okay. Okay. So the first point is sort of a um, a sort of a tangency is, is is sort of a tangency notion, right? So I'll I'll prove. So I remember omega is where the tangent line meets the x-axis, and theta is where the the the, the probing path, the p1 og, exits the x-axis. And the first step um, is to basically show that omega and theta are close. So the probability that they're of some distance epsilon n is decaying with is de decaying exponentially in n. Okay, the second step is to show that theta is more, it concentrates, it's deterministic. And this, so this theta is approximately theta n up to some error um, with high probability. And this theta is exactly that previous theta. It's this, um, it's this, it's this maximizer. So if I, if I define lowercase theta in this way, then the second step is to show this concentration estimate, which shows that this theta exits the x-axis at this point. And this is more or less straightforward. Uh, I'll explain in a second. Uh, the second step is basically done by is, is basically done. Um, the third step, okay. The third step. Um, so in a sense, I, I, I located um, what the last issue that I mentioned with the tangent method is that the new path, this p one of the introduction of this new path, might mess with the Arctic curve. So the third step is to um, is to sort of compare p one and p two og. So it's to show that this green path to compare this green path with this red path. Okay. So this will proceed through a coupling procedure. Okay, so I'm going to couple the laws of E and E psi in two ways. Under the first way, the first coupling is going to make um, P1 strictly below P2, is going to, sorry, weakly below P2 log. So I'm going to couple these two ensembles, E and E psi, in such a way, in one way, so that the red path lies below uh, the green path. Okay? No, I'm good, I'm good thanks. The, the second was so that's coupling number one. Coupling number two is to I'm going to couple them in a different way so that P two, the second path here, is weakly above the green path. Okay. So in a sense, this is sort of some form of sort of some form of a sandwiching. I'm going to try to sandwich this P one, this 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 green path between the first two paths in the original ensemble. So that's sort of the first part of step three. And the second part of step three is to show that. The bottom two paths in this ensemble are, are close by each other, so the probability that they're far away from each other is small. Okay. So this is the big outline of the argument. And um, okay, so uh, let me just try to quickly say why you're why 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 we're, we're we're done once you do all those things. Okay. So okay, right. So let me let me first show that. Okay. So so let me try to. I'll just sort of scribble a few things on the board, indicating that if I can put the, if I have all three of them, then I'm done. Then I'm done. Okay. So, um, okay. So let me. Um, okay. So what I'll first show is that I have this, this e, and it looks like this. Okay. So and then I have this e psi, which looks like. So this is p1 og, and this is p1. Okay. So um, okay. So the fact that okay. So point one will tell me that okay. And this is the the genuine um, okay. So I'll, I'm now drawing this L 
this, this orange line is outside. So what, P, what this first property is more or less telling me is that um, the tangent line, this tangent line exits at some location omega, and this P1 aug exits at some location theta. So what the, fir what the first thing is telling me is that I can more or less replace outside. The tangent line is more or less the same as the line through 0 minus psi and theta 0, right? So, so what step 1 implies is that L psi is close, which I'll write. I'm not going to make everything, um, I mean, for, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll just write approximately equal to, which more or less means can be pre made precise with these probability estimates, is more or less the line connecting, uh, I'll, I'll denote this for the line connecting two points, 0 minus psi and, uh, omega, uh, and uh, theta 0. Right? Because theta is approximately equal to omega, and I know that L passes through omega. So what the first step is telling me is that these are approximately the same. What the second step is telling me is that this line here is approximately equal to the line connecting 0 minus psi and theta n 0. Right? Because the second step is telling me that theta is approximately equal to theta n. Okay? So this is more or less telling me that I know that I know what L psi looks like. I know that this tangent line, the, the true tangent line to P1 aug, is approximately equal to the line connecting 0 minus psi to this, which is deterministic to theta n, which is also deterministic. So more or less what I've managed to do is I've managed to uh, say that L psi is very close to a deterministic line connecting two points that I know. OK, okay now the third, OK, now the, how, how do I finish from here? So I know that, um, right, so. Uh, yeah, I know that the, so now what I know is that um, L psi is approximate, so the, tan the, the tangent line to this, to this P1 aug is approximately um, bounded above by, okay, so what, this what these two are telling me is that P P2 aug, this, this green curve, is approximately bounded above, if, or by approximately, I mean if I shift, if I shift by a small amount is approximately bounded below, by which I mean this, this line is, this P1 aug is, is above uh, this, this line here. This L of 0 minus psi to theta n 0. So what I know is that this P1 aug with very high probability is, is, lies above some deterministic line. Okay, and then by this coupling, by this coupling, I know that um, P, uh, I know that um, P, P2 aug, I can couple E and E psi in such a way that P2 is weakly above P2 aug. So that means that if I know that P2 aug is, if I know that this green path is above some deterministic line, then with very high probability, because of this coupling, I know that the second path here is above that deterministic line. And then because P1 and P2 are super close together, that carries over to P1. So what this is basically saying is that I know that P1, this red path, is above the deterministic line connecting, uh, uh, connecting theta n and, and psi. Okay? And now if I vary over all psi, what that will immediately tell me is that this red path is above, is above the Arctic curve. And then you could do something similar to show that it's below the Arctic curve using the other stochastic, using the other coupling. Okay, so this is sort of a sketch of, of how, to, how to finish it once you have those three steps. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so, uh, okay, good. So now I'll, I'll try to outline how to, how, to, how to implement this proof. And I should say that two, step two is, is more or less done already by the computation I had from this slide here. Because I can exactly count the number of I can exactly count the pro I can actually, I can exactly compute the probability that um, that 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 theta is equal to some value. It's exactly given by this thing. So it's, so the compute so the, the fact that uh, the the concentration estimate for this theta is just due to the exact formula for the number of augmented ensembles with a certain value of theta. So this is just a straightforward steepest descent. I mean, just uh, sum of binomial coefficients more or less, so, and then just compute where 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 the where the maximum of that sum lives. So step two is sort of um, is sort of a straightforward saddle point analysis, if you want, or just s analyzing a sum. And now it remains to analyze steps one and three. And actually, uh, ironically enough, it's three that's sort of the the thing that takes that takes the most work. In particular, the, the second part of three, uh, showing that P one and P two are close by. But maybe uh, I have 
about 10 minutes left, I think. So I'll try to, I'll try to prove this first step, this tangency step. Okay, okay. so um, I'm going to, okay, so, uh, right. So the tangency will actually be quite quick once you, once you set everything up very carefully. The tangency is not, not so difficult to show. So um, I'll first need to introduce some notation on the boundary data. So I'll start with some rectangle lambda, lambda, and I'll introduce two, I'll, and I'll say that two pads are vertices. I mean, so you can view them as pads. I'll view them, I'll say that two pads, x and y, They can touch, but they can't cross. Satisfy x less than or, equal, or x is less than or equal to y if x always loves ab loves above y. Okay, so this is just a definition. I can also make the same definition with vertices. For example, if if x is a path and v is a, and y is a vertex, then in this case I'll also write x is less than or equal to y. So this is just notation. Okay. Okay. So I'll introduce these barrier paths f and g with f less than or equal to g. So here they are. They're, they're drawn in orange. And I'll denote entrance vertices u, u1, u2, all the way up to um. And these are supposed to denote sort of entrance data for these paths in the ensemble. And then I'll also define exit vertices, which are v1, v2, all the way up to vm. And these are supposed to be exit paths on the ensemble. So u1 and u2, this order in here, indicates that it starts, uh, the indices go up in this direction. So as I, as I traverse the path, as I traverse the boundary, the bottom, uh, the bottom and left boundary of the rectangle this way, the indices increase for u. And likewise, as I traverse this way, they de they they increase for v. Okay, so that's what so that's right because um, because as I go up this way, I'm going north. I'm going northwest. So yeah, um, sorry. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just notation. So I'm setting up this boundary data for, 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 for these ensembles. And I'll let this fancy E of F, G, U, W, because that's a mouthful. So U, U and V denote the entrance and exit paths for the ensemble, and F and G denote barrier. So, what, what this, is, so this E, F, G, U, W is going to denote the set of six vertex ensembles on this rectangle whose paths enter and exit at these U's. So they, like P1 enters at U1 and exits at U1, and P2 enters at U2 and exits at, 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 at V2. And it lies, they're non-crossing, and they lie between f and g. So this is just a definition of a certain family, or a certain restricted family of six vertex ensembles. OK, so now, OK, the key, the, th the thing that I'm going to use again and again is this monotone coupling. OK, so I assume that I have two families of boundary data. OK, so I have f, g, u, v. So f and g are, remember, the barriers, and u and v are the entrance and exit data. And then I have the prime diversion of these guys. And what I'll assume is that everything in this picture lies southeast of everything in this picture, by which I mean if I sort of relate indices. So for example, u1 lies southeast of u1 prime, u2 lies southeast of u2 prime, g lies southeast of g prime, f lies southeast of f prime, et cetera, right? And it's same for, for v1 and v2. This has nothing to notice about the relationship between u1 and u2. I don't, I, don't, I don't make any claims about that. All I say is that matching indices are, are, are dominate each other. So like u1 is below and southeast of you. Okay, yeah, I already said that. So, okay, okay. So then that gives me two sets. That gives me two sets. Some E F G U W and some E E F prime G prime U prime W prime, and I'll denote them by E and E prime. And I'll pick out at uniformly random two ensembles E and E prime from these two sets. Okay. So I'm going to pick them out uniformly random, and I'm going to denote the paths in, in, in these sets by p's and p primes in the obvious way that's suggested by the notation. OK, and now the lemma that I'm going to be using a lot is that I can couple the laws of E and E prime so that the paths in this ensemble lie southeast of the paths in this ensemble. So like P1 is southeast, uh, sorry, um, yeah, P1 is, can be, the two models can be coupled in such a way that P1 is southeast of P1 prime and C, P2 is southeast of P2 prime, et cetera. OK, OK, and uh, OK, so this is, this, is, this is this sort of monotone coupling statement. Uh, are there any questions about that? Are you going to define what you mean by coupled for people who are not? Oh, OK, yeah, right. So a coupling, OK, so, uh, right. so a coupling is a, a, prob so, um, a probability distribution on pairs on the set E cross E prime, such that the marginal distributions, if I project to each factor, it gives me the uniform distribution on each factor. So maybe. <laughs> Um, so it's it's a probability distribution sort of this uh, this e times e prime such that the sum of 
pi of, if I sum over the, the second coordinate, then I get this is uniform on E. So if I, if I sum over the second, if I, if I sum over the second coordinate, then it's uniform over E. And if I sum over the first coordinate, um, then it's uniform on E prime. So it's just a way of, it's just a way of um, jointly sampling E and E prime so that the marginal projections are uniform on both factors. Okay. So, okay. So I should say that this allows f and g to more or less not exist. So I'll say, I'll, I'll say that f is, I, I, I can allow these f to be minus infinity and g to be plus infinity. And all that means is that I pull the orange path off to infinity and I pull, I pull f to, to like the, the strong, like the, the northwest infinity and I pull g to the southeast infinity. But in so doing, basically removing those boundary conditions. So I'm allowed to set these guys equal to infinity um, as needed. Okay. And the proof uses certain, um, uh, certain um, monotonicity properties of the Glauber dynamics of the model. I'm not going to talk about that, though, because I'm running out of time. So I'm skipping the proof. Okay, and the two things, okay, so I'm going to need two more facts that are, are, are probably very familiar. I mean, I, I imagine that they're very familiar to this audience. Um, it's just the linearity estimate for, for, for random walks. So this is very basic. So if I just take two vertices u and v with v northeast of u, and I set the distance between them to be, to be m, then a uniform random path between u and v is very close to being linear. So the distance from p to the line is bounded by some constant. I'm uh, sorry, is, 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 it decays with, um, is the, the, the probability that this is, with very high probability this is small. And likewise, if I condition on this path to lie below, below, below the line. Okay. Okay. So now let me try to outline how to prove, this is going to be quite quick now. How to, I'm going to try to outline how to prove that P1, that this omega and theta are about equal to each other. So remember that theta is where the tangent path, the, sorry, this, this augmented path exits the x-axis and this theta is where um, the, the actual tangent line exits the x-axis. Okay, so I'm going to condition on various things now. I'm going to condition on, um, and I'm going to let u denote, w denote the point, so where, where, where the, this brown path intersects, or gets, it gets very close, gets within one of this line. Okay, and that has to happen somewhere because these guys eventually are next to each other, right? So at some point, this, this brown path is going to meet the tangent line, okay? So I'm going to condition on the following data. I'm going to condition on all of the paths P2 aug, P3 aug. I'm going to condition on the green path and everything above it. And I'm also going to condition on everything in the brown path above W. So all the randomness is left between this vertex, which I call U, and W. And the Gibbs property tells me that, um, and I'm, okay, and the Gibbs property tells me that the law of this P1 aug is, is given by uniformly random walk condition to lie below P2 aug. So this is, uh, this is, uh, the fancy word for this is the Gibbs property, but it's a fairly obvious fact if you, if you think about it for a moment. If I condition everything else, then the law of, of, of this bottommost path, this P1, is simply given by a random walk, a uniformly random walk starting at U and then at W, but conditioned to not cross P2. Okay, so now, okay, so now why, why, why are we basically done now? Okay, so, um, so, okay, so I'm going to do, I'm going to couple this in two ways. I'm going to get a lower bound and an upper bound on theta. So in order to get the, um, in order to get the, the lower bound, I'm going to compare this model. So remember, all, the Gibbs property tells me that P1 aug is given by a beautiful and random path conditioned to lie, to not go above P2 aug. So one thing I can do is just remove P2 aug. Okay, I'm going to define a new model where it's just a uniform random path from U, from U to W with no barriers. Okay, so by the monotonicity, I know that I can couple the brown path and the, the blue path so that the blue path lies above the brown path. Okay, now from the linearity, I know that the blue path is basically linear. So if I denote the location where this blue path exits the x-axis by gamma, then I know that gamma is approximately equal to omega, right? The, the, the line and the path have to exit the x-axis at approximately the same point on the blue picture. Okay, but now since I know, so that's, that's this statement. Um, yeah, okay, so, that's, so that's, that's this third bullet point here. Um, now by the monotonicity, again, I said I can couple the brown and the, and the, and, and the, and the, and the blue path so that, um, so that the brown lies below the blue, which corresponds to theta being greater than, omega, uh, the theta being greater than gamma. So I can, I can couple them in such a way that almost surely theta is greater than omega, oh, sorry, the theta is greater than gamma, so that's this, this bullet point here. So, that, so, that's the, uh, so yeah, that's this point here. And this is telling me that the probability that theta is bigger than something is at least the probability that gamma is bigger than something. But now from this point here, I know that gamma is approximately equal to, to omega. So this is, 
This is telling me more or less up to some error of epsilon n that this theta is basically going to be bigger than omega. So that gives me a lower bound on beta. If I want the upper bound, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the green path to the diagonal. So I'm going to push the green path all the way to this dashed, to this dashed L. Okay? So once I do that, again, I can do the monotone coupling. And I can say that the brown path, on this, on this, since, since this orange path, I'm, I'm pushing P2 aug down to the diagonal, which I can do because P2 always lies below the line. I can push P2 down to the diagonal. And th this tells me that in this new model, the brown path lies above the, the blue path. And then I, I, I do the same. I play the same game now. Now using the fa fact that a random walk condition to lie below the diagonal is, is basically linear. So this tells me that gamma and, and omega are close. And I also know that theta is less than gamma. So that means that um, theta is less than omega. So I have that theta is less than omega and theta is greater than omega. That tells me that, that they better be the same. And I'll stop there. And sorry for going a little over time.